All right, I was so excited about giving the last lecture yesterday, but I uh, got a little carried away and I offered myself one more. Uh, and why am I doing this? The reason is that, um, you know, I've, I've basically spent so many years telling my students, here's what you should do in a figure, here's what you should not do, here's how you should organize your, your text, here's how you should write each paragraph, so on and so forth. And um, I feel that it almost sounds like a surprise to every one of them when I say it. And it shouldn't be that way. We should have more resources for doing this systematically. And I apologize that what I'm going to show today is um, not either at the level of maturity, not at the uh, <laughs> uh, caliber, and not at the um, completeness that, or clarity that I would like, because I only decided to do this yesterday. Um, but uh, I, I still hope that it will be helpful. Um, it's a shame to be presenting with PowerPoint because I have so many more ideas than what I have time to put in a PowerPoint. And uh, maybe I should start with just some random remarks <laughs> and, then, and then I can go through the slides that I've put together largely from uh, pulling content from uh, online resources uh, that uh, I, I will sort of point you to as well. So <clears throat> there's two things that you guys have to present over the next few days. So basically, number one, on Monday, you have to turn in a scientific paper. And then uh, number two, on um, um, uh, on Wednesday, you will basically give presentations live. And there's basically different skills and different mindsets that are, that are needed for each of them. And for the paper, the main thing that you should think is how do I convey my research? How do I get other people's understanding? The reason why this is so important is um, you could do the best research in the world. If people don't understand what you did, it's as if you didn't do it because you're not going to impact anyone. If you don't publish it, it doesn't exist. If you publish it in an incomprehensible way, it's the same. It's as if it doesn't exist. So basically, your goal is not to sound smart. Okay, nobody will grade you for sounding smart, but impenetrable. Nobody will reward you for that. Like, you know, there's no, there's no grade rubric <laughs> into how smart was a student in, in our assay. And there's no, no one will cite a paper because it sounds smart, even though they don't understand. It. Okay, so make it sound simple, not complicated. That's the goal. Okay, so basically every single time you're thinking, how should I write this? Think of the first way that you would write it. And then picture yourself, me saying, um, what does that mean? And then you stepping back and say, oh, oh, oh. Um, and then phrase it a second way. And then picture me saying, oh, so basically this means, and just type that. You get it? Do you see the difference? So basically very often we try to sort of construct this very formal language as to how to describe something. And in the end, it's just speaking English as to what you actually did that sort of will convey the message the best. And then the second round of, oh, so what you basically did is, that sort of stepping back from that simple presentation and thinking about what is the impact of what I did? Why does it matter? How does it relate to sort of all the other things I could have done? Does that make sense, everyone? So that's sort of the, the main thing that I want you to do. So basically describe, and, and you know, every paper goes through this. Describe your main idea. You know, why is it important? So basically, of course, start by giving the context. That's what the introduction is about. And then tell us why that context has a problem, what's missing. That's a good place where you could describe general background work without getting into specifics. Oh, and so-and-so did this method, and so-and-so did that method. Because that's a cognitive burden that I have to go through when reading your papers. Basically, I have to sort of now not only understand the problem statement, but also understand three different previous iterations at solving it before I even get to yours. And by the time I get to yours, I'm exhausted. And frankly, I don't think it's so interesting anymore. Basically, it's just yet another approach to solve the same problem. Instead, what I would try to do is start with your introduction where you frame the problem of why it's so darn important. Because if I don't care, I'm not gonna pay attention. So basically, if you're giving a talk and I'm listening to 10 talks in a row and your talk just doesn't sound that interesting, I'm, I'm just like, that will be a good time to sort of make sure that, I don't know, uh, the connection is working or check the time or see how we're doing or see whether the other team has responded, et cetera. Like we all get distracted and it's much easier to get distracted 
if you don't sort of get immediately enticed. So the third part of the presentation that I've prepared today is how to actually get people to care about the problem, you know, during a live setting. But that the same thing applies to a written work. Basically, when you're writing a paper, you have limited attention span. I mean, you're competing with, I don't know, WhatsApp and with, um, <laughs> I mean, I'm dating myself here, maybe Twitter and Facebook. You guys are probably using much cooler things nowadays, like that cat. Um, <laughs> but um, you're competing with all these other distractions that are constantly bombarding everyone as they're trying to read the paper. So you have to make it concise, interesting, appealing, understandable, comprehensible, you know, sort of flow, you know, like, and check your grammar, check your spelling. Basically, if I find grammatical problems, it tells me that you haven't paid enough attention to your paper and there's probably all kinds of other mistakes too. It doesn't say, oh, it's not an English native speaker because I'm not a native English speaker either. And there's grammar tools out there. There's Grammarly that I get ads for all the time. I mean, use it. Uh, you know, there's resources out there. You can talk to a native English speaker, talk to, talk to someone who's not in your field. Because if they can't understand it, you're probably doing something wrong. Basically, you know, the, the, the best papers are the ones that are really understandable by a broad audience. I fight so much with my students when by the fifth paragraph, there are three acronyms in every sentence. <laughs> no, I can't take that sentence out of context and understand it. I can't just like start reading your paper in the morning and finish in the afternoon without rereading everything to figure out what are these acronyms again. Like, and I'm your advisor. <laughs> Imagine someone who's not your advisor, who's not in your field, who's like, you know, just interested in that general field. So get rid of acronyms, get rid of as much sort of, you know, unnecessary complexity as possible and try to convey your message. Are you guys with me so far? Do you feel that this is useful? Yeah, good, good. So, so please uh, <laughs> um, tell me if you have questions, et cetera. So I'm just gonna sort of bombard you with advice that I'm constantly giving to my students. Um, another huge, huge piece of advice is the axis. Like when you label your axis, um, I, dare, I, I sort of uh, challenge you to look at your paper after hearing my comments now and, and sort of count the number of figures that have that problem, okay? So very often, nearly every one of my students and trainees over, you know, 10, 15 years has basically come to me with a figure that, although y-axis has minus log 10 p-value, right? How many of you have made a figure like that, right? Minus log 10 p-value. Sounds like a fine axis label, right? Um, the alternative is, of course, no label. <laughs> and then there's stuff going up and down. And I have no idea what it is. And I'm working with like 10, 15 students. There's, there's a lot of diversity in what everybody's working on. I can't constantly remember what are you actually trying to visualize. So what's the problem with minus log 10 p-value as the axis label? It's that it could be about geology, just like astronomy, just like biology, just like botanology. It could be anything, okay? Um, it doesn't, it only tells me how significant something is. And the, and the metric uh, that we're using for that significance, okay? or pressure, or count. Like very often I've seen like axes that, that say count on this, on this way. Like that does, doesn't tell me anything. What, what really I want to see is the thing that matters for your paper. What you're measuring is significance. The way you're measuring it is minus log 10 p-value, okay? There's a very big difference. And even what you're measuring is not enough because it doesn't tell me what is it significant relative to. So basically maybe the label should be, you know, significance of enrichment between enhancers and traits, right? So parenthesis minus log 10 p-value. That's a tiny little font in parenthesis because that's just the metric that you're using to measure it. Is everybody with me? So I could say pressure or I could say atmospheres, but much more interesting to the reader is higher pressure before explosion in the accident, right? That's, that's the actual thing that you're trying to measure. Who's with me on this one? Awesome. Yeah. No? No? On the figure. Give me a three-line legend or like axis label. I don't care. It's so much more interesting to me than just having pressure there with a lot of white space surrounding it. I'm not typical in, in saying this, okay? 
the, the entire field of biology appears to love like you know um, visualization where you're basically looking at the microscope and you're labeling mitochondria but they don't say mitochondria they say whatever stain is used to label mitochondria I don't know what stain that is or if they don't say nuclei they say whatever stain is used to label nuclei or maybe that stain is actually a histone protein stain and I don't I, to me it doesn't say histones it says nuclei and that's what you should label because if you're trying to reach a broad audience you should label the thing that you're trying to show not whatever axis whatever metric whatever label whatever dye you're using I don't want to hear you know, um, B39 red. That doesn't mean anything to me. Mitochondria means something to me. You guys you see what I mean? And again, I'm not, I'm not traditional here. There's a whole school in, in the biology world that just doesn't think like me. And I, I, I collaborate with them all the time. And very often when I tell them, hey, how about we label this this way? They're like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> so the receptive to this is just that the training is very different with like a three character caption, which is an acronym for an axis label. And like, you know, it's impenetrable to me. Does that make sense? Right? So, um, great, I actually have prepared some slides. So maybe I should go through the slides. Uh, <clears throat> so how to present, um, and again, often people that have stolen these slides. Um, so, the first thing I included is some general advice on figures. The second one is on writing your papers because your figures will go both into your papers and into your talks. And then the third one is the actual presentation. Okay, so the figures part is superbly important no matter what you're trying to convey. Okay, and then the, they will go both into the paper and to the presentation. All right, so let's dive right in. So, da -da -da. how to design more effective scientific figures. So, this one I stole from Ayora Zabala. From Cancer Research UK, and I do not have her permission. <laughs> Sorry, um, I should. Um, so um, this is a course that she taught. So um, all right. So basically, there's um, some base, and, and again, I don't feel that she created all this material either. To be honest, I think that um, there are other sources on the web that that she seems to have also stolen this from. So. <laughs> slightly less guilty but uh, I will eventually acknowledge uh, the original um, uh, contributor which I think it's months here yeah. um, all right so basically um, this is just some lay of the land of sort of what are the things that you can uh, use to represent things so basically you can use points you can use lines you can use areas and then you can uh, visually in trying to sort of get at what you're showing you can basically uh, choose to move things horizontally vertically both use color Use the tilt, which is horrible. Use shape, use size, area, volume. And humans are very, very different in perceiving this. And we're generally very, very bad at perceiving some of those things. So that's why it's important to sort of recognize the type of channel that you're using, the types of attributes that you can use, and then how to sort of show quantitative um, uh, you know, properties. So you could basically make something salient by changing all of these things and you know the the effectiveness of every one of these channels actually depends on the um, ability to actually recognize so you know brightness depth area length smoothness and <laughs> electric shock are basically you know perceived uh, very very different uh, in very very different ways and you know for example um, you know, we're just not very good at perceiving some of, some of those things. So for example, brightness or depth is something that we're just very bad at perceiving, but we're much better at perceiving saturation or length and, you know, we're so at area, okay? You probably don't want to include electric shock as one of your uh, stimuli in your paper. Um, so, and then the other question is, how do I show the data? Do I use a graph? Do I use a table? And in some cases, you know, one is actually better than the other. And you can illustrate the relationship over time or across different categories, a comparison between two different things. And that's another, another thing that I want to sort of get at, which is when you have a ginormous uh, heat map, which basically shows many, many different data points, 
And the point you're trying to make is just that this point is different from that point. Sure, maybe you want to show the heat map for completeness so that everybody can sort of check your data. But at the same time, right next to it, it's okay to show a bar chart comparison of just those two different entries. So basically, you should constantly think, what is the story that I'm trying to say in generating your figures? If your paper really relies on the comparison of these two things as sort of a main conclusion from your findings, extract it out. It's okay to show it redundantly. First, show it as part of the largest heat map, and then you could even put a little box and an arrow and then show the two side by side. Um, and then composition, distribution. Um, and then you could say the same thing in very, very different ways. You could basically sort of compare things in a, in a series of bar charts. And to me, this is just very, very complicated. Basically says, oh, well, this is slightly higher, this is slightly lower, et cetera. Or you could actually show how things progress over time, or you could sort of break it up by larger areas and so on and so forth, okay? Um, again, when you're looking at a comparison, you could show both the mean and the standard deviation or some you know, confidence interval or you know, percentile um, breakpoints, but you can also show the primary data. If there's only like 25 data points, it's okay to, to show them this way. And this particular uh, plot is uh, actually dithering the points where the x-axis doesn't actually mean anything, it's just spacing this, the points out. Everybody with me on this one? And again, you can sort of show this relationship between continuous data that basically sort of you know, highlights the differences. And it's perfectly okay to put an arrow in your figure. Like, don't, don't just say, oh, that's my figure, I'm, done, I'm not gonna touch it. In my view, you can just scribble on the figure. Like, every time you're presenting the figure to a colleague, you're gonna to point to exactly, hey, look, this, this point is the big, you know, the big uh, outcome. Or maybe it's the fact that this one ends up higher than that one. It's hard when you're an outsider and reading a paper to know what is the salient feature that they're trying to convey. And it's perfectly okay to either put a black arrow that points to here or to put a red box surrounding it that basically highlights what is the take home from that figure. Everybody with me? And again, you can use bar charts for comparisons. You could, um, uh, so what's wrong with this chart? It basically shows a 500 fold difference between A and B, right? But if you notice the axis is actually cropped. It's 50, 75, 100. I've seen plots where it's like 55.627, 55.628, 55.629. And you're like, whoa, there's a 500 fold difference. But in fact, if you plot it with zero as the bottom, basically then realize that, oh, this is just a 10% difference, okay? So basically always make sure that you're not misleading the reader into thinking that the differences are either bigger or smaller. And sometimes people are shooting, them, shooting themselves in the foot. Maybe what they're trying to show is that there's actually little difference, but they crop their axis anyway. And then they're both misleading the reader and giving the opposite conclusion of what they're actually trying to show. And um, if you look, here, I find thick lines just overly overwhelming. And sort of much thinner lines is, you know, sort of boundary is actually very nice. So how many of you have actually used Illustrator before? Awesome. How many of you know how to use more than 10 of the functions for Illustrator? Awesome, good. So um, the rest of you embrace Illustrator. It's an incredibly powerful program. So you can, you know, you can really just take a figure from PowerPoint, paste it into Illustrator, and it already looks better. And then, you know, whatever tiny little changes, like you can then right click on this boundary and say, select all with same stroke weight and color, and it will select all of them. And you can just add a, you know, in the touch of a button, sort of make it thinner, you know, maybe get rid of these boxes altogether. Um, and again, sort of um, put the axes where they matter. Basically, if some things are, um, so, so one of the problems that we have is that ratios, for example, are very difficult to, to visualize in a uniform kind of way. You can basically, um, you know, a, a change of one half appears very different than a change of twofold going the other way, but they should be symmetrical. And what log plots allow you to do is visualize that symmetrically. Everybody with me on this one? Um, however, something I really don't like is that humans are very hard at sort of doing log three in their head. I mean, what's log three? It's hard, right? Log two or three. Um, but instead, 
I would write directly the number there. Even though you can visualize it in a log scale, your tick marks should actually show, and the numbers next to the tick mark should actually show the actual number. So if it's a half and two and four and eight, just show half, two, four, eight, even though you're spacing them in a log scale. And you can include little tick marks that are showing that it's a log scale by having them spaced in a log kind of spacing, where they're like dense at the top and spread out at the bottom. Is everybody with me here? So again, don't force the reader to do math in their head. Do the work for them. You want to sort of simplify their understanding of what you're trying to do. You're not testing their, their algebra skills uh, as they're reading the paper. Everybody with me? Um, so again, if you're, if you're trying to emphasize percentages, scale them this way. If you're trying to emphasize overall um, you know, number, scale it that way. You can basically show categories this way. If all of the numbers are adding up to one, it makes no sense to show them as bar charts next to each other. Instead, add them up. Again, think about natural interpretations of what you're showing that sort of would make sense, you know, even when taken out of context. So pie charts are generally a very, very terrible idea. Humans are very bad at interpreting pie charts because you're very confused as to what is the area. Am I, am I looking at area? Am I looking at angle? Am I looking at, and sort of depending on whether something's at the top of the chart or the left of the chart, interpret it differently. So avoid uh, pie charts if you can. Um, and again, showing confidence interval makes sense. Um, you should sometimes switch the cumulative distribution if what you're trying to show is you know, um, better reflected there. And box plots are super, super helpful. They basically capture, you know, um, ranges and medians and means and, um, you know, outliers uh, very nicely. Whereas this kind of distribution kind of hides all these things and, and it's hard to tell where they fall. Um, and again, uh, showing the overall distribution with your, you know, with gray points is actually very helpful sometimes. And very often, um, we are completely misinterpreting data because of saturation. When you have like, I don't know, 500,000 data points, it's very easy to sort of think that, oh, there's just as many points here as there are there. Or when it saturates to complete black, I don't know if there are 10 times or 100 times or 1,000 times more points here, but sort of showing these sort of gradients actually uh, really helps where you can show both individual points and show the stacking of many, many points on top of each other. And you can use many different dimensions. You can basically use uh, the, sh the, the color and the size and the position and so on and so forth. So you should think about what are the important things to show. And if there are more than three different dimensions, then yeah, sure, use color as an additional dimension, use size as an additional dimension. But again, don't do it just because you can, because then it becomes you know, uh, nonsensical and, and overwhelming. And here, if the size actually reflects you know, number of people living there, for example, that's a very intuitive thing. But if the size reflects something that's not related to size, then it's very difficult to uh, interpret that. So think about sort of natural intuitions that uh, you can have. And again, this is a combination of uh, looking at both the number and the significance and the actual data underneath, and also projecting these distributions along this axis. It's a way of sort of using the different components of your uh, figure in interesting ways. Heat maps, I find uh, extremely, extremely useful. Basically, if you're trying to visualize a network, use a heat map for the adjacency plot matrix. It's much harder to sort of see uh, things sometimes when the network is very dense, but with a heat map, it's very easy to sort of see this cluster here and that cluster there and so on and so forth. Um, And then again, there's a whole field of maps and sort of making sure that you are interpreting data in a meaningful way. So basically, you know, you've seen these maps of the US voting all the time, where you basically have these vast areas of sort of no one living there that appear all the same color. And then if you scale it by the number of people, it's, you know, it captures things very differently. So think about that in your genomics representation as well. So uh, this is just a um, menu of charts that you can use to represent comparisons, relationships, composition, distribution, you know, across one variable, two variables, three variables, and so on and so forth. So again, I will make all these slides available so you guys can uh, use them.
uh, and then you can use you know all kinds of R functions to, to visualize all that. So um, the font you're using is also super important. Basically, for um, most applications, I I just go with sans serif. Basically, the fewer bells and whistles, the better for almost everything. And then aligning things <laughs> is extremely important. Um, and I, yeah. So when you're presenting your slides, uh, remember to use the same font and the same font size as much as possible. If there's really a reason for changing font size, you should. If it's simply that, oh, there's just too much text in this bullet point, <laughs> just remove some of the text. Okay. So basically, don't don't have this clash of font sizes. Don't have this clash of colors. Don't have this clash of alignments. Um, and remember, you can use this alignment function. You can basically select two or multiple things, and then you know, click align top, distribute horizontally, and so on and so forth, which makes it much more appealing uh, to see. Um, So basically, you should always ask, is the figure self-contained? Is it understandable without additional information? Is every element labeled or explained in the caption, including X and Y units? As much as possible, I try to move things from the caption to the figure, you know, so that somebody who's just staring doesn't have time to sort of find panel C and where in this five line wrapped description is it actually written what that thing means. Just put it on the darn figure. I mean, there's, there's space there to actually put it there. Um, show scales to show the appropriate vari variation, uh, make sure that it's readable, make sure that it, the, there's enough contrast, make sure color is well used. Uh, some figures work well in grayscale or just white to blue or something instead of rainbow. Rainbow goes to very high contrast and it's very, very difficult to interpret, especially for people who are, you know, colorblind in some cases, you know, just the, this color and also the way that it, it stimulates us even if you can see all three colors, uh, or if you have all three photoreceptors, as you say, you can um, you can still be misled by you know something becoming very dark and then very white, very bright and then very dark again in one of those sort of uh, rainbow plots. So usually, when you look at magnitude, just use you know either grayscale or some single color scale. Um, and in general, basically the process is you first collect the data, then you process the data. And then you do some exploratory analysis. So I like to say that rule number one of genomics is look at the darn data. So basically build representations, visualize it, sort of look at the genomic axis, look at sort of all kinds of other axes before you build your statistics. Because from the visualization itself, you might actually get some ideas and insights and intuitions that your, um, you know, that your um, statistics might not cast. Yes, it might be significant, but for all the wrong reasons. Whereas if you actually look at the data, you might realize, oh, wow, there's all these outliers or there's all these zero points or, oh, there's a huge agglomeration of points in exactly that location, the graph, maybe something's wrong is happening there. So always visualize. And then you clean up the data sets and then you generate your conclusions. And only at that point, do you actually write a statistical test to basically say, you know, is this actually significant? Of course, the statisticians would basically say, no, you have to decide all of that in advance before you actually explore the data. But for the genomicist, data exploration is a huge part of what you're doing. And, you know, just as a rule of thumb, don't, think, don't pick things that are just marginally significant. Pick things that are, you know, sort of well above the significant threshold. And then you build draft figures, and then you basically, uh, you know, produce the actual figure. And only after that, you sort of paste it into Illustrator or into Inkscape, and then you sort of generate the, the uh, feature-ready version. So basically, you guys should have done a lot of that already throughout the term, and now you're into this final stage. But in some cases, you might realize, well, the way I'm visualizing things actually totally, you know, not reflecting what the underlying data is, and go back to some of that before your final page. Yeah. Yeah. We have that. So MIT has some licenses for it. <laughs> there are pirate versions out there, uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, but Inkscape is actually free. Yeah. So. If you have access to Illustrator, use it. If you don't, uh, ask MIT or ask your lab to get it. Um, and in some cases, you can install it in a common computer. 
and then you know whoever's working on the figures could use that computer uh, or have an illustrator. Um, so I also um, added some stuff on sort of labeling your axes. I mentioned sort of count. Don't, don't just write count, write number of enhancers or number of enhancers showing differential enrichment or something. Don't say log p value, say minus log, you know, say, um, oh, the p value that the association is random or more like t to d association, right? So basically, if you're reading a paper, you want to see, oh, that's the association with t to d. No, and, and, you know, what's the metric? Oh, minus log 10 p value. That's the thing that you're measuring. And this is how you're measuring. Very often people put the label as to how you're measuring it instead of what you're measuring. Um, here's an example of a, of a three line, uh, you know, wrapping figure to basically describe something that previously had not even a, a, a legend. So here it says reported trait associated lead single nucleotide polymorphisms across 534 genome wide association studies, parenthesis, only 100 representative traits shown using a bag of words approach. Okay. All of that could be in the legend, and all you could be reading is traits. But what are these traits? These are the traits that are enriched in those tissues. So this is just one of those things where it's okay to have legends that sort of wrap around. Um, it's okay to sort of have across different panels of your figures, little things that sort of show a zoom out and a zoom out again. So here you're basically showing the overall genomic context with some prominent stain map and an enhancer here. And then as you're zooming in, this peak turns out to have diffs. And as you're zooming in further, these diffs, you know, can be further subdivided into finding that motif that I showed you in lecture two days ago. So this is actually a figure from the paper that sort of, you know, shows this zooming out and therefore you show the context and uh, all of the additional information all within the same uh, figure. Here's another example from that same figure where you can see here, for example, there, you know, I could have just shown a scatter plot, but instead I'm actually showing with an arrow something that says example in C comma D, replicate two versus replicate one. Okay, so here's C comma D, and you can see replicate two versus replicate one. And here you can see tile number four, tile number five. And you can see again tile number four, tile number five here. So, and then tile number four, replicate one, tile number four, replicate two. So, by coloring blue, blue here, you're recalling that this is tile four. By coloring this red, you're saying, oh, this is tile T plus one. So you have an example that actually illustrates the point that another panel is trying to make. So you can use that in your own papers to basically sort of have both the global view of a bunch of scatter points and the local view and sort of the zoom out. And then there's always sort of falls back and forth between these figures. Is everybody with me here? Here's another example. This is a paper that we wrote a few years ago where you basically have in panel A, three example genes that show increased synonymous constraint. So this is one gene, here's another gene, and here's a third gene. And you can see here how the synonymous constraint varies across the length of the protein. And now you see these three highlighted you know, areas, which are then recaptured in these plots. You can basically see each one of those examples where you're like, oh, this guy here is extremely constrained. And here's the example. And in fact, the previous figure had the actual alignments for all of those. And now here, you can basically see one that has a positive uh, constraint relative to the genome, but negative relative to the rest of the ORF. And you can see here the overall distribution, which is then projected down and actually matches that distribution here. And this axis, again, matches that figure here. And this axis here matches that figure there. So by aligning your figures the right way, you can actually get the reader to sort of be able to build across these examples to get intuition, to get back into the alignments and actually see you know, what is being represented. So again, our field visualizes ridiculously complicated things. And by having examples, walking them through, you can kind of tell that this catapult is not just a random set of points, but it actually represents something very physical and something very intuitive that you can see in the other. Who feels that they've learned stuff so far? Yes, good. All right, so now in terms of paper organization, you've made your figures, you've done your analysis, how do you actually present uh, the results? So something that I always tell my students is as you start on a project, write the outline, write the title. <laughs> 
lay out the figures. And that's sort of what I've been asking you to do throughout the term. As soon as we started, I basically said, for your midterm report, put the full outline, put the full layout, tell us what figures are still missing. And the reason for that is that when you know what papers you're writing, it guides your actual research to be much more focused on what is the outcome that I'm trying to achieve. Is everybody with me on this one? And this goes for any stage of research. The initial title and outline of your paper will be boring. And eventually you'll find something super exciting and that will become the whole section three. And that's okay. And maybe your previous outline will get condensed into just a quick introduction and your paper will now be that section three and that section four, which are two awesome findings from your paper. Or after you find you know, the thing in section four, you might realize that, wait, that's a whole separate paper in itself. Or that that's exactly what my paper is about and everything else is supplement and flip the paper around and reorganize it. But be ready to, to revise, but start with an outline, start with a set of goals, start with a message that you're trying to convey because that will guide you to be much more focused rather than just do exploratory analysis and then say, okay, how do I save story now? Does that make sense? So even in exploratory fields like genomics, always have an initial outline sort of guide your actual research. And then make sure that the clear message of your paper is coming through. Basically ask yourself, what is the key finding? What is the key idea? What is the key contribution of my paper? And sort of say it in the title, say it in the abstract, say it in the introduction, say it in the result, say it again in the discussion, say it again in the summary, okay? Say it everywhere, say it in the figures, say it in the figure legend. Basically, this is not a suspense novel. A research paper is not something where, oh, well, you know, I'm just gonna read this just out of interest under a palm tree. And when I get to figure four, I'm like, oh, wow, I did not expect that at all. Right? That's not what you're trying to get of your readers. You're trying to sort of hook them with exactly what you're going to tell them and then tell them what you were going to tell them and then tell them that you told them what you just told them. Okay? So you just beat it over the head, beat them over the head with it. So um, know what that click is, what that idea is, and don't get distracted by all these other things. If your paper is about you know, some big exploration and every paragraph is an idea, that's a very different paper, but these papers are very rare, like the human genome paper or the roadmap and the genomics paper or the ENCODE paper. These have many, many ideas, and it's okay. There are some papers like that, but most papers should have one clear take home. And if there are two and they're competing with each other, they're reducing each other's strength, and you should split into two papers. We did this with one of my students recently. He had written this magnum opus with like, you know, a, home, a completely new theory and how that theory completely changed our understanding of the emergence of life on Earth. I was like, you can't do both. So write two separate papers, one on the theory and how it applies to all kinds of cool things and one of the biological idea and how that theory applies to it. And understand that the two papers intertwine, just put them both in bioarchive at the same time so the reviewers have access to each other. But make sure that the papers are sort of well self-contained and they have a clear message. Everybody with me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, completely okay. Yeah. And again, the, the, the world of publishing has changed. We put things on my archive all the time. So you just put it as a preprint and then you can cite it from whatever other paper and eventually they will both appear and we'll be citing each other. All right, and then decide on the flow. So you state the problem, why it's interesting, why it's unsolved and why your idea is actually super cool, okay? And, and you should do that in everything you do, not just for the paper for, you know, Tuesday, but for, mm, Monday, <laughs> uh, but for, <laughs> don't use that against me, uh, uh, but for everything you do, like basically you write an application for grad school. Don't just tell them, oh, I worked on this data set and I did this and, uh, you know, this thing came out and, you know, we published it there. No, say the state of the field was such and such and there were, you know, we were stuck because of this. And the key insight that I had was that. And that led me to the realization of this, and I found that, and I learned one key biological finding, which is awesome. And at the end, you can say, well, yeah, here's all the new directions I can go to. And in your paper, you can say, you know, here's why it's better than related work. I know it's a little counterintuitive to basically put related work at the bottom, 
But if you start with your title, your abstract, your introduction, the problem, a bunch of related work, again, I have to go through the mental exercise of understanding each of those. And by the time I get into yours, I'm thinking about a dozen different things, as opposed to, you know, a general statement of sort of what is the state of the field and why perhaps, you know, in a vague description, other methods don't work without getting too much into the detail of those other methods. Say the few salient things that make your thing different and sort of emphasize those. Basically, maybe yours is the first multi-core method to do it. And just say, but dramatically, there are no multi-core methods that do it. As if that was a big problem before you came about. Maybe it is not, but that, you know, sort of you, can, you can sort of pitch it in a way that shows that the one thing that's missing in the field, you can lay out the field in a way that shows a big hole there. And it turns out that your thing is exactly fitting into that hole. But it's your narrative. You get to draw that hole. And if you draw the hole to fit exactly your solution, then people will sort of understand why it's needed. Sometimes it's a stretch, sometimes it's much more natural. But if you don't do that exercise, nobody will understand why what you, thought, what you just did is both important and needed. And then, so basically after you've described your awesome idea, then come the details, and then you basically say, well, there were three other methods for doing this, and here's why we're better than this, and here's why this method doesn't apply at all, and here's why this method ran out of time before, you know, like after two months of running, and it will never work. Okay, and it's okay, but if you put all of that up front, people are busy trying to understand these other methods that just wouldn't work at all. Is everybody with me? And then you basically sort of give the conclusions if you, if you work. So you should think of this in the same way that you would in uh, presenting your idea in a whiteboard or, you know, sort of describing this to your friend or to your colleague or to your, you know, uh, Europe student or something. Okay, basically, this is exactly the same flow that you would use, and this is exactly the same flow that you have in your paper. Everybody meet with me? And then intuition is paramount. It is extremely important. Don't just focus on the technical part, okay? Sometimes, if they've understood the intuition, you won the battle. Then they can spend the extra five hours to understand every single technical detail, but that's only for the people who are in the field, who are working on that thing. Most of the folks will just not care about all of that stuff but they will care about the intuition. And even the people in the field will care about the intuition. Okay, so the intuition is not just something for the non-experts, it's something for everyone, including the experts. So once they have the intuition, you know, they can follow the details. Um, but if you skip, you know, but even if they skip the details, they'll take away something valuable, which is the intuition. The opposite is not true. Basically, I've heard research presentations that spend most of the time on a tiny little implementation detail and then I don't understand what they were even working on. And that's, that's wrong. You should really sort of emphasize, here's why it's important. And yeah, sure, I had some cool implementation details that, that sort of made it work. And again, um, very often, we describe a paper in a completely different way than what we went about doing uh, the discovery of whatever we found, okay? So after the fact, you rewrite the story to actually make sense to the reader. This is not about you, this is about the reader. So you write the story in whatever way makes it easiest to absorb and to understand and to appreciate what you did, right? Don't just say, well, first we did this and that didn't work. And then we did that and that didn't work. And then we did this and kind of worked. Uh, so then we improved it that way. And, you know, chapter five of your thesis and then the third improvement is this. And then at the end, you're like, you know, as opposed to sort of flip it all around and basically say, you know, the main thing, here's what actually worked. And then... In section six, you could just say, hey, here's a bunch of other approaches that don't work. And it's okay. Then you can sort of describe all the things that you failed at for the first two months of your project. But describe to me the thing that I should take away. Because if I'm done, you know, you know I don't know, get run over by a bus and <laughs> I don't finish reading your paper, um, I, I will still have gotten the most important thing. Yes. Yeah, put it at the end. Yeah, say the thing that succeeds first so that I have a complete story. And then you can just say, we also tried alternative approaches, including this and that and that, and they did not perform as well. Our interpretation is that this is the reason why. Does that make sense? Don't put that at first because I'm investing my time and energy and love and passion in sort of reading this method that I'm enamored with and it didn't work. I'm heartbroken. I'm reading the second one. I'm like, well, I'm kind of non-committal about it. Will I love it? Or will it just let me down again? Whereas if my first love story is really working, 
Then I can be like, oh, well, this didn't work, but let me read about them. Hmm, I have some insights as to why they didn't work. It shouldn't be an exploration exercise. It should be rewritten to make the most sense. Here's the thing that works. And by the way, these other things that you could have tried don't work. And that's okay to include in the paper, but put it afterwards. Does that make sense? Because if I'm let down every time I embrace a method and I want to learn all about it, I, I'm just not going to make that investment the third time around. Okay? Anyone else? Any other questions? Great. Um, oh, and, and don't just submit your paper as is. Get others to read it. Basically, um, you can read it. You, know, you can have it written, uh, read by experts, but also non-experts. And non-experts are extremely helpful in that. And, um, you know, it, when they tell you where they got lost, that's, you know, very, very important. Okay? So basically, spell check it first so that they don't focus on that. They can get past the grammar and the text and the language to sort of focus on the important part. Um, and then when you're done, you could even send it to the competitors and basically say, can you make sure that I describe your work fairly? Okay? And suddenly they have motivation to actually read your paper. And then they can say, oh, your thing sucks, or, and they will be the ones that will have the most helpful critique, okay, because they care about the area. And then how do you incorporate the feedback? You don't make it, you know, <laughs> personal. You basically fix the paper so that X is apparent even to the, you know, stupidest reader, okay? So instead of just saying, oh, gosh, you know, of course it's there. No, it's your fault if they didn't see that it was there, okay? Every time a student doesn't understand something in my lecture, it is my fault, not their fault. That's why I'm encouraging lectures all, uh, questions all the time. Because if you're not understanding something, probably 50% of the class is not understanding the, the same thing. And it's my fault for not explaining it sufficiently well. Okay? So if somebody doesn't understand your paper, it's your fault. I have someone who is a very close friend of mine who was basically running this enormous company uh, worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And he recently, um, you know, he had invested $100 million in sort of understanding something uh, that, that was just incredibly important. And he's telling me how the board shut it down after he had invested $100 million in learning that thing. And that thing was the most important thing that had ever been done. And, you know, you could understand all kinds of things from it. And I'm like, I, I told him this point back. It wasn't the nicest thing to say, so, but I basically said, so you're basically saying that you didn't do a good enough job explaining how important this was. <laughs> right? Here she was blaming the others for not understanding how important it was. And I was like, well, it's your responsibility to have them understand it. If they don't get it, it's your fault for not explaining it at the right level, with the right intuitions, with the right hooks that make them click, and so on and so forth. Okay? So don't blame others for not appreciating your paper. Don't say, oh, this is the best paper ever. Why did they reject it? No, it's your fault. Explain it so that even either the stupidest person or the most ill-intentioned person cannot see past the importance of your achievement. Everybody with me? Great. All right, so don't wait, write right away. Identify your key idea, tell a story, nail your contributions, present related work afterwards as a reason to explain why none of that would even apply or even work or why it didn't work in practice. And then put your readers first. Don't sort of say your life story. Get them to understand uh, that. Okay? Who feels that they've learned stuff? Yes? Good. Awesome. All right. So, oh yeah. Also, um, use active voice. Don't ever say, it can be seen that. No, we can see that. 34 tests were run. We ran 34 tests. These properties were thought desirable. We wanted to retain these properties. It might be thought that this would be a type error. Oh, you might, da, da, da. Okay, so make it all super, super direct, active. Here's what I did. And again, there's different schools of thought. I see generations of students writing in the passive voice. I don't, I don't, I, I don't buy that. Um, and again, uh, the object under study was displaced horizontally. <laughs> the, move, the ball moved sideways, okay? on an annual basis, yearly, endeavor to ascertain, find out, okay? <laughs> we next endeavor to ascertain, it could be considered that the speed of storage reclamation left something to be desired. The garbage collecting is really slow, okay? So speak English. Nobody speaks like that. Why would you write like that, okay? Everybody ready with me? All right, so this is for the written part, yes.
Yeah, no, I, I um, thank you for, for bringing that up. I feel very, very passionate about this. In fact, that also reminds me of another, another pet peeve. So I'm going to say the second one first so that I don't forget. And then if I don't answer your question, remind me. Um, so the, um, the, one of the main things that I do, every single time a student comes to me with a, par with a paper, I do the following. You should try that on your papers right now. I take the last sentence of every paragraph and I put it first. Why? Because every student comes to me and their paper will basically read, we next um, uh, aligned these with that and we found this and we found that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And in the end, this indicates that uh, X is uh, highly related to Y, okay? So as I'm reading their paper, I'm stuck with a bunch of details. And the most important thing is the conclusion of that paragraph. So why anyone would start with a conclusion? And how can you make that work? So the way that I do it is that I basically say, we next found that X is related to Y. Specifically, we plotted X against this axis and we plotted Y against that axis and we find a linear relationship within the two etc. This works, right? So at first you say the thing that they should take out and then you add details on the methodology. So that flips things around. It doesn't say, oh, look at the methods in the supplement. It describes a method, but first the result. So you can, you can always do that. So try it on your own papers. <laughs> take the last paragraph and basically say, oh, is this the most important sentence, the last sentence of each paragraph, and say, is this the most important sentence? If it is, put it first and change the phrasing a little bit so that it flows more nicely and the methods that support this finding are following directly afterwards. Why is that helpful? Because afterwards I can just read the first sentence of every one of your paragraphs, the one I care about, I'm going to read the whole paragraph. Okay? And it walks me through a series of results that basically describe what you did in your paper. Who feels this was useful? Yeah? Good. Um, now to go back to your question, which was... Oh, the methods are relegated to the supplement. All right, so here's, here's how I write papers. Um, instead of basically saying introduction, problem, methods, results, I weave them together. So every single time you describe the method and the results together, and then the method and the result together, and the method and the result together. And of course, that method description is not going to have three paragraphs and five equations and two figures, all of that is going to be in the method section. And that's okay. Put enough of the method there that an intelligent person with no background in the field is able to understand it. Okay? Assume your reader has infinite intelligence but zero background. Okay? And give them all the stuff they need. Don't use jargon. Don't use, you know, acronyms. Don't use equations because What's an equation? An equation is like a series of deciphering things where, you know, for X and for Y and for Z and for F and for theta, you have to figure out what it means. It's not the way that we think normally. It's not a sort of plugging all these things in. That's a very nonlinear way of describing it. I've replaced so many equations from my students with just English text. That basically describes, we then deconvolved, you know, we took the principal components, et cetera. You could write the principal components equation and it will be nonsensical. You can just say the same thing in English. And then they will get it, they will have the intuition, and then the rest is in the supplement or in the method section. Does that make sense? So, um, and, and therefore, when you condense the methods to an English description of what you actually did, using, of course, mathematics, that's okay. You can use mathematical words, but don't use equations. I like to say that every equation cuts your readership by 10%. It's probably 50%. So, so it decreases geometrically, basically. Uh, so, so in the same, same way, I, I think of acronym. With every acronym, you lose 10% of your reader. It, it, it just works that way. People just don't understand your paper. Um, so that's why instead of having a long method section and then a long result section, why would I read the methods? Again, it's the whole thing of falling in love with the methods. Why would I love a method that in the end gives me nothing? Instead, I want to know if something actually works. Oh, great. Now I can begin to appreciate it. You see what I mean? And then I'm invested 
because I know this thing actually works. I see the result, I'm like, ooh, that's a cool result. How did you do it? Right? So if you start your presentation on Wednesday with first we tried, you know, building a linear classifier between these, and then we tried building a regression, and then we built uh, you know SVM, and now let's switch the results. Well, it turns out that the first one didn't work at all. <laughs> the second one didn't work at all. By the third one, we realized we had misprocessed the, the data set, and you know, sorry. <laughs> right? People were like, oh, so what parameter did he use for the you know, neural network? What uh, decision boundary did he use for their random forest, etc.? And in the end, it didn't work. Why would I pay attention? Flip this around and say, we were able to classify the samples with 98% accuracy when other methods were doing 56%. Do I have your attention now? Now you're like, all right, let's see. What were the methods? Now I'm interested. And now I'm paying attention to see wow, this result sounds too good to be true. They probably did something wrong, et cetera. It's much easier to engage someone when they know that the result works than if you're just trying to, you know, first introduce a bunch of methodologies. Does that make sense? Are you guys finding all this useful? Good. All right. Now, the last part is you've done your research. You've created your figures. You've submitted your presentation, your, 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 your uh, final project report. And it's now Monday night. You wake up on Tuesday morning, exhausted. You're like, Phew, that project is done. <sighs> and you open up your eyes, you're like, oh, I have to present it tomorrow. Okay, so that's the third part. Okay, how do we actually present orally something that you've now done such a good job presenting in a written form? Okay, and there's uh, a whole class on this, 6U18. It's actually what I was teaching in the spring. And this is taught by um, Tony Eng, who's like, Absolutely awesome and magnificent. I cannot begin to uh, emulate him because it's not possible. But what I try to do is summarize in uh, a quarter of a third of a lecture um, a whole term of awesome material. So I hope all of you will take. How many of you have actually taken 618? Awesome, great. So anyway, uh, you know how charming and how you know full of energy Tony is when he walks into lecture. Like everything stops. So. Um, I can't emulate that, but um, I, what, I, what I try to do is sort of extract away some key take, take home, okay? So basically, number one, the importance of conveying your work. Number two, how to speak clearly. Number three, how to plan your talk, storyboarding, signposting, and recovery. Number four, how to be convincing with your rhetoric. Uh, number five, how to connect with your audience. Number six, you know, summary, okay? So very briefly. Um, so technical skills are very often the emphasis and presentation skills often lack. And the goal of every presentation should be clarity. That's what we emphasize a lot. But number two, persuasion, confidence, integrity. And number five, which is hugely important, something that many students say is the most important thing that they get from security, matching it to your audience, okay? So that's what 6UAT is all about. It's about sort of conveying your work, okay? And then, uh, you know, we first do a self-introduction video, which is all about posture. Where do you even stand in the room? How do you sort of engage with your audience? Do you use your hands? Do you just sort of stay like that, et cetera? And that sort of makes a big, you know, thing. Do you make eye contact? I mean, you see me walking around and looking at each of you, basically make sure that you're following. I'm constantly stopping and saying, who's with me? Raise your hands, et cetera. I mean, this is very non-standard. I show up at lectures in sort of big, big conference calls and I basically say, who's with me? People are like, I'm like, raise your right arm if you're with me. Like, who has a right arm? And then I break in like smiles and I say, oh, come on, you're obviously aligned. You can see all these right arms. And then people raise their arm and I'm like, who's with me? And then by then, by the, by the end of the talk, they're all with me and they're all sort of raising their hands. They're all like asking questions and engaging and stuff like that. And it's an exercise that I go through because very often people are just passive. They're like, oh, that's not for me. I'm just going to be looking at my phone. When they realize it's for them, they pay attention in a very different kind of way. Okay? So you've noticed this in my, in my lecture, sort of how I'm constantly asking you for feedback. And, and it's the same thing that you constantly do. You're giving the talk to someone. Don't forget that someone. I've seen professors that I respect tremendously show up and they're constantly like looking at the lamp as they're speaking. And then they're, you know, you know, they're getting their words together and, you know, they have this like back and forth tick and, you know, it, it, <laughs> I've seen people like 
check what's up there in the room. It's weird. But what changes when you make eye contact? When I make eye contact, I can tell if you're following immediately. Like you've seen me in lecture where I'm like, you know, like, like I'm stopping because people have this puzzled look. And when I, when I say, you know, uh, raise your hand if you're with me, the way that you raise your hand tells me how much with you, you are. <laughs> it's not just, oh yeah, come on, keep going. Like I can tell when people are not following and I can sort of stop and adjust and, and reflect because if I have blank stairs by slide three, there's no point in going through slides four to 17. Stop there and make sure that the audience is connecting. Okay, and the audience knows that and sort of making eye contact, understanding the facial expression, understanding all of that uh, makes a very big difference. All right, so basically we do this exercise in self-introduction and you know, the goal is memorability, having a hook, using these rhetorical devices and then sort of, these are some of the things that you're penalized for. So for example, if you don't speak loud enough, I mean, I was teaching a course this summer and I sat at the end of the room for the, for the most quiet students. <laughs> For all of the students I was sitting right here, I actually stood up and I went all the way in the back and I'm like, mm. and then they were projecting and I could actually see the change that was happening and suddenly everybody was following. So it makes a very big difference to sort of, you know, be able to actually be heard, be understood. And, you know, um, the, the stop that you do uh, is extremely important. So again, when you first think, walk into the stage, the reason why you're on that stage is because they respect you in the first place. That's why they invite you. But when you walk into the stage, that's where you're giving your first impression. And you know, before you walk in there, you're, the company you work for, your reputation, your credentials, all of that you know, got you in the, in the first place. But then the content of what you say and the delivery of how you say it is sort of what will then be evaluated, okay? And, that includes your voice, your attire, your age, your body language, your poise, your posture, your facial expression, your eye contact, the knowledge that you're exhibiting when somebody asks a question, the fact that you can show that you know a lot more than what's on the slide makes a big difference. Your confidence, the fact that you're actively, you know, sort of hearing back the audience, you know, who you hang out with at the coffee hour. Like basically, if you're at the coffee hour and all, you're, all you do is sort of speak amongst yourselves or you don't talk to anyone or you're listening to calls, it's a very different impression than if you're the one talking to the big professor or the big you know, person who started the field and so on and so forth. So all of that matters when you go to a conference. So think about that and sort of how you treat others. So basically you have seen people, like I was at a talk yesterday where the moderator made these really nasty comments of one of the panelists who was basically asking a question of the other panelists. And that reflects really badly. It was like, so, you know, are you going to ask me questions next? Ha 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 ha. Like, that wasn't funny. That clearly showed that you were annoyed because you were not doing a good job. He took over and he was suddenly asking the other question. <laughs> sure enough, five minutes later, he was asking her a question, <laughs> which was hilarious. Um, but but um, the fact that she was treating him with disrespect was, was obvious. So if I show up and, you know, there's a person working with the AV and I'm really nasty at them, can kind of tell that I'm not a nice guy. So be respectful of others because everyone will actually evaluate that as part of their esteem of who you are. And they're like, well, if they're not respected to the AV guy, why would I collaborate with them? Because next thing you know, they're not going to be respectful to me. Okay. So your overall uh, treatment of others matters a lot. Your mood, your emotion. If I'm, you know, depressed, you will be able to tell. If I'm sick, if I'm, you know, blah. Like, it's very different than when I show up and I'm like, well, today's one of my favorite lectures. This is like super exciting material. You know, you sort of, you know, it's, 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 a, it's, um, it's contagious. People can tell that you're excited and they get excited too. Um, the proximity. So basically notice I'm not sitting out here, right? I could be lecturing from here. I'm always putting my computer all the way in the front and I'm making contact with you guys. I mean, that's, that's very different. Um, you know, the, the way that you shake people's hands, the things that you do, like basically if you cut in line at the coffee, or if you actually are gracious and you clean up a spill that somebody else made, all of that uh, shows. Um, and again, you can use all kinds of resources to sort of improve upon all these aspects. I totally understand we're way, way over time, so you can <laughs> head out. Um, all right, so that's, you know, the delivery itself. 
Then there's the stuff that you do before you get up on the stage. And a lot of that is planning your talk. So basically, how to storyboard, how to sort of create landmarks that you can follow, and how to recover. So the storyboard is the way that you organize your overall lecture. So, you know, most of the time, uh, uh, stories start with once upon a time, which basically establishes the background of the field. And every day, you're sort of the situation until one day, that's the disruption. Okay. And then the disruption is we now have a problem. We have way more data than we know how to store, or we now have an opportunity. There's all these new genomes that we can start mining. Okay. So that's the disruption. And because of that, you know, something happens because of that, something else happens, et cetera, until finally, and every day since then, and as a result, et cetera. But this is not very different from the way that we're actually writing all, all these scientific talks. But in the same way that a scientific talk can follow the standard pattern, and a story can follow the standard pattern, there are many stories that are nonlinear, that don't follow this pattern. So for example, there are storyboards where, you know, you kind of start in the middle. Like, I don't know if you've read the Odyssey, but the Odyssey doesn't start with the beginning of Ulysses' trip. It actually starts in the middle. And then you go back to the beginning, and then you sort of continue to the end, right? Um, this is Memento. <laughs> I don't know if you've seen that movie, but it sort of starts here in uh, color, and then in black and white, you go backwards, and then in color, you go forwards. Um, you know, there's arcs like this and arcs like that. So you can be very creative with your storyboards rather than follow one of the typical uh, storyboards. And in the same way, you can basically take a four slide talk and sort of swap the order around depending on the audience and depending on the effect that you want to have. You could basically say, well, um, you, know, the, you know, there's a lot of new comparative uh, genomic data out there. So this gives us an opportunity to build a comparative genomic method. And that's what I did. And here's the result that I, that I found. Or you could basically say, wow, I just discovered that, you know, uh, mice have evolved three times faster than humans. And the way that I did that is by developing a new method that now I, I, you know, that has all these cool intuitions, which I then applied to all of these new comparative genomic data. Okay. Or you could say, wow, I found this really cool thing, which uh, was enabled by all of this comparative genomic data. But the way that I did that is this particular method. So there's many ways that you can go through your narrative to have the most impact, sort of connect with your audience the best. Okay. Uh, and then, you know, here are some examples. Um, so <clears throat> recovery is extremely important. So it's a skill that's worth practicing. For example, if the projector doesn't work or the system of functions or the room is not set up properly, ask for help, work with the person, be kind, make a joke. So basically I could show up here, and basically spend five minutes setting up in silence while all of you guys are waiting. Or I could basically say, hey, who feels that they can use this AV system? Please come on up. And maybe two people will come up. I'm like, can you guys set that up while I'm giving the introduction? Okay. We're all working together. I'm super kind. I'm, I'm nice and generous and, and friendly, but I'm also valuing everybody's time. Right. Or I could instead start yelling at the AV person <laughs> or something. So, you know, you, you can sort of work you know, uh, to, to solve these problems. If somebody's really asking a lot of annoying questions, you can basically tell them nicely, great questions. And my next few slides will address them. Please ask me again at the end if I haven't fully addressed your comments, right? So I, I, I immediately know when I go to a, to a general talk, if somebody asks a question with like three jargon terms, they're just trying to impress me. They're not really trying to, to, to answer anything. They're not trying to understand anything. But I can tell as a speaker, comprehension questions from show off questions. And you can shut down the show off person by basically saying, wow, that's really great. You obviously know a lot about this field. Why don't we talk about it at the end? I'd love to chat, you know, chat with you and learn about your own work, right? Because you're basically putting them back in their place. You're basically saying, well, it's clear that what you're trying to do is show off your knowledge and your work to all these others and to impress me and to impress them. But you're obviously distracting from the talk that everybody wants to hear. So you can kind of deal with you know, that class of questions by basically saying, wow, you obviously know a lot. Let's talk at the end. And you can deal with the uh, sort of, oh, I'm going to ask you a dozen questions that are in the next slides uh, by saying, well, um, you're basically putting it back onto their court. You're basically, now it's their responsibility to figure out if their questions are not answered. And they won't know that until the end of the talk. So, you know, they can't interrupt you anymore. Does that make sense? So if somebody's making a lot of noise, 
you could um, you know ignore or gently say, well, let me pause for a moment while you finish unpacking, or you know, you could just say, please be a little quieter so that everyone can hear. Because this is not about me, this is about everyone else. If I basically say, hey, you're interrupting my talk, it's me versus them, as opposed to, oh, um, the, the people behind you can obviously not hear me anymore. So just as a courtesy to them, can you please stop you know, making noise? Does that make sense? So you're sort of um, being nice to others. So if everybody's getting ready to leave lecture, I do that <laughs> sometimes. I only have a few moments more. Please wait for a moment. If uh, the talk time is cut short, some major VIP is leaving, you could rearrange your slides, you can rework the storyboard, you can skip some sections, you can only give the main point. If you realize that the wrong slide deck is loaded, it's an old talk or some slides are missing, if it's minor, you can just roll with it. I've seen people who are constantly saying, oh, well, clearly the animations are not working. Uh, so, well, since the animations are not working, and then three slides later, they're like, well, in the animation that you did not see, et cetera. Like, enough. <laughs> we all could see that you had a trouble. No need to sort of beat us over the head with it. Instead, you could just roll with it and just, you know, describe it as if it was there. Basically, I can just easily say, and what you would have seen is that, you know, these cells are now red instead of blue, and that makes a big difference because it means that. Da, 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 and, you know, if you can continue. Or if it's a ma major, you could just take a moment to rearrange or preview. Uh, and <laughs> what I always do before a talk is that I, I actually load it up on my phone and I go through it because I save everything in Dropbox, so it's immediately in Dropbox. So basically that's when I get my thoughts together and that's when I can also find problems and sort of adjust on the spot if I see that it's the wrong thing. Or if the fonts are all off, you know, make a kind joke about it, connect with the audience, uh, you know, maybe they're just a surprise. All right, so, you know, there's some common storyboards or a problem and a solution, a technology, uh, you know, that enables an application, some trends and a merger of trends or hey, we did it. Remember, that's what I was saying earlier. And then how we did it, now that you know that it worked, or this is how it was in the past, this is now, and this is the future, or here's what is and what could be, or moving from simple to more and more complex. And then some good uh, properties of good storyboards is that they flood logically well, the material is set up properly, but also minimally. You don't want to hear five introductory slides before I even get to what I did. The takeaway is highlighting a payload position and it's an ordering you can actually recall because if I get confused in my own ordering, that's not helping anyone. Um, and it grabs interest and it sustains interest and it matches the audience. And you can build your own storyboard, um, you know, with various ways. Um, the last few things is how to be convincing. So basically when preparing, determine your message, create your story, use narrative, work on the slides, Plan the boardwalk, anticipate problems, and determine the intro. While practicing, do not memorize. Do not sort of, you know, memorize. If you have to memorize something, memorize the first sentence. Basically, thank you all for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to tell you about my work on XYZ, period. And now the rest should not be memorized. Um, the, the bullet points should help you tell the story, but you should not be reading. Again, in the same conference yesterday, I saw somebody who was, you know, he had a picture of an iceberg and he was just pointing to the iceberg facing away from the audience for like, you know, a good minute while he was talking. <laughs> There's only one iceberg on your slide. They're not going to miss it. And you're sort of turning your back to them. And there's really no information there that you're gleaning out. And there's really no detail that you're pointing as to the top or the bottom of the iceberg. You're just circling it. So uh, again, connect with your audience. And part of the reason why I'm, sort of using the pointer this way rather than pointing that way is that I'm constantly facing you, right? Every time I switch here, I'm not sort of switching away from you. And you'll notice that I've switched my pointer to always be this red pointer because a white pointer you would just never be able to see. Okay, so it's a trick you could use as well. Okay. Um, so again, do not memorize, speak, Naturally, practice pieces rather than the whole thing at a time, because otherwise it'll sound robotic at the beginning and totally unpracticed at the end. So practice different parts. And then re-storyboard if you find that it's not working well. I, I, I have to say that I've given hundreds of talks, so I don't need to practice anymore. But what I always do is that I work in my, in my head, just each slide, and I'm sort of trying to understand what is the logical flow. I'm not thinking of words of the transition, but I'm just thinking of the logical flow of the transition of my slide. Before every talk, I always do that. I never go up there and then sort of discover slides on the fly. 
I always, before every lecture, before every talk, sort of work through the mental transitions in my head just to understand the logic, not to practice transitions. And then, you know, re-storyboard if it doesn't work. And again, do not regurgitate, interact with your slides, take an interest in your audience, modify the jargon, buy the audience time, use verbal punctuation and visual punctuation, and then control the audience of how to go through. And then the three devices, the three rhetorical devices, is on one hand, logos, namely the reason, the logic, the proof, ethos, which is the credibility, the trust, and then pathos, which is the emotion and the value. You could go up there and say, you know, um, we built this new image recognition device, which can be used in a medical setting for improving the speed with which doctors can, you know, see a patient and react to the result. You know, that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is the population is getting older. People are getting sicker. The health system is overwhelmed. Doctors, frankly, don't have the time to see patients for as much as they're needed. There's so few doctors and so many patients, they might give their own diagnosis if they're not able to spend enough time with the patient. This is just simply unacceptable. Imagine your loved one being in the emergency room and the doctor simply didn't have time to look at the radiology long enough. We have to fix this problem. And the way that we did this is by developing a new method that allow you to now immediately extract information from the radiography to really help the doctors save your loved one, right? It's, you know, I'm engaging your, you know, sort of societal problem and then I'm making it so personal because it's your loved one and I'm starting with the problem, starting with the impact and then only at the end getting to what we actually did, right? So it's sort of a very different type of rhetorical device to try to get people engaged. And again, it's all about your audience. Just like for writing, it's all about them. In speaking, it's the same thing. It's all about them, not you. Help them understand. Appreciate how difficult it is. Guide them and adapt your talk to the audience. Get rid of the jargon. It's not a, you know, basically, I will say regulator in some settings. I will say controller in other settings. I will say prescription factor in other settings. So basically, depending on how specialized the audience is, you can basically say, you know, TNF beta, you know, uh, motif, or you could say the sequence pattern in the DNA that's recognized by the corresponding protein. You know, very different things. So, you know, depending on the audience, you can sort of tune your jargon. So again, help them appreciate why your technical contribution matters. Break any rule as long as it helps them. Uh, by the end of the intro, they should know the overall direction. By the end of the intro, they should understand your title. You should cover everything on your slide. If something is not important, don't put it on the slide. If something is important, cover it. Never put something on the slide that's just sitting there. And what you say should be consistent with what is on the slide. And don't tell them anything that they won't need later. So they're investing their time in sort of remembering this thing. And in the end, it turns out it was a red herring. They didn't actually need it. Um, and then tell them what they need to know before they need it. And then both verbally and non-verbally help them parse what's important. And the more time you spend, the more important something should be. And the more you repeat it, again, the more important it should be. Don't repeat things that are just not important and then tie everything together with a sense of finality, and then be memorable, be creative, be different, and actually teach them something. So again, the relation statement is what you start with, sort of connect with your audience. For example, your loved one is in the hospital, et cetera. The narrative is sort of how you build uh, up to that. And then the by statement is sort of, we did this by doing that. That's sort of where the method comes in. And the intuition is sort of before you explain, uh, you know, what you actually did, and then comes all the hardcore stuff. So that's the payload, uh, you know, technical details of how something actually works, and then come to conclusion. In terms of who understands what, the general public should understand most of that. And as you go down and down and down and down, the people in your group should actually understand almost everything, okay? But this part here doesn't need to be fully understood. Does that make sense? By everyone. So again, don't water it down too much. There should be a payload. Don't just sort of explain in vagaries what you actually accomplished. You know, tell us the technical part, but give us first the intuition. So, um, all right. So then master your delivery, uh, minimize surprises, build credibility, focus on the goals, and then gain uh, beauty. Sounds good? For those who took six uh, UAT, who feel that they've uh, sort of refreshed their memory usefully?
All right, great. Um, all right, so um, you have another 48 hours or so to finish all your projects, et cetera. You have another 24 hours to sort of finish your write-up, make it really awesome, use all the skills that you've uh, heard about, and then you have another 24 hours that, after that to prepare your presentation. And of course, I'm assuming that none of you are taking any other class. <laughs> You want to walk and talk with them? Uh, yeah, of course.